Uh, let's get started today. Uh, so I want to first finish up the discussion on on the uh, field effect transistor, or the ballistic uh, field effect transistor. And um, um, what we did in the last class was spend a lot of time trying to uh, figure out how uh, how the gate uh, uh, the, the the gate metal on top there controls the the number of electrons in a two-dimensional electron gas, which is, uh, uh, you know, these are mobile electrons, could be in the conduction band. Uh, uh, actually, you can turn it around. If you have a P-channel transistor, that would be in the valence band. You might have holes. But uh, we're looking at the conduction band at this point. And, and so the number of electrons that you can induce uh, by looking at the gate as a parallel plate capacitor is what we were trying to evaluate in the last class. And, so, so, and then what we uh, ended up with was a, 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 a transcendental equation uh, that relates the, the two-dimensional electron gas density in the, in, the, in the semiconductor conduction band to the gate voltage that you apply on the third terminal. Uh, and uh, this transcendental equation uh, is uh, it's extremely important um, because that really uh, is is the key uh, uh, for uh, switching of a transistor, uh, and it has a solution which is for small gate voltages uh, an exponentially decaying function, and for large gate voltages it it, it kind of uh, becomes uh, more like a polynomial. And the reason for that is uh, what you are really doing is you're moving the Fermi level inside the semiconductor, you know. Uh, below the lowest allowed subband and then into the gap and when your Fermi level is way below the allowed states or the allowed density of states uh, uh, so so this uh, let's say this is the two-dimensional electron gas ground state and then uh, let's say your conduction band edge is over here and uh, if I'm uh, and with the gate metal uh, the Fermi level of the metal is here and I'm kind of moving this down or up, right? And uh, by that, uh, when I'm going up, I, uh, when I'm moving this up, uh, I'm moving to the right. And uh, I'm inducing electrons, and my Fermi level uh, enters effectively the, 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 the density of states, and you get a very large uh, uh, el electron density. So the electron density would be effectively the Fermi function Let's say this is your Fermi function. In the, in the channel, uh, or occupation function in the channel, which is uh, 1 over 1 plus e to the power, the energy of the electron minus the Fermi level. And we said that that's really the in equilibrium with the source. And that's, uh, uh, and they are off, you know, this, this, this difference is q times Vgs. Right? what you apply. So if I move my Fermi function uh, up into the bands and then I get a lot of electrons and then uh, uh, you know, you're kind of over here. But then when I uh, kind of release my gate voltage or I go negative, then, uh, 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 you know, the, then, then basically I'm pulling the Fermi level down here. In other words, if you keep this fixed, you can imagine I'm taking the Fermi function down and the Fermi function kind of goes here, and you empty out these states, and you have very little electrons left in the conduction band now. So you kind of switch uh, the 2D electron gas on to off, and you can do that uh, with a very small voltage. For example, here, we just minus Vt is a few, you know, few point, I mean, 0.5 volts or so, and you can go by change it by a uh, factor of 8 or, or, or 10, to, 10 to the power 8 or 10 to the power a billion or something like that. So uh, uh, now uh, we worked through the details yesterday, uh, sorry, in the, in the last class, and we wrote down the expression for, uh, for, for the, uh, the quantitative expression for the electron density as a function of the gate voltage. So I'm not going to kind of repeat that. That's uh, again uh, in, in, in the picture and, and the way we did it was we drew the energy band diagram and we kind of started out from the left side and 
you know, did a, an energy, energy circuit, if you might, you kind know, of climbed up and then ended up on the Fermi level on the right side. And the difference of the two Fermi levels was the gate voltage rate. So, you know, your energy band diagram looked uh, something which uh, I don't know, was 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 uh, of this nature, right? Something <coughs> like that. So here, here and then, and there was electric field between the metal and the semiconductor, and this was an insulator or an oxide. So this is a capacitor, right? So the total in integrated two-dimensional electron gas density here is what we are calling n sub s. That's the number of electrons per unit area, sheet density, and uh, uh, we, we 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 found that uh, uh, I could write an expression like this, uh, sheet density over a certain characteristic uh, density here, where n sub b is came out to be the capacitance uh, per unit area of the barrier times a thermal voltage, I'll write this out again, divided by electron charge. And uh, so capacitance per unit area is the dielectric constant of the barrier, epsilon b typically 10 times the permittivity of vacuum, typically. Uh, depends, I mean, you can have uh, high K dielectrics, like hafnium dioxide, which is about 20. Silicon dioxide is only like four, four times uh, uh, permittivity of vacuum and so on. Uh, divided by the barrier thickness, typically the barrier thicknesses are reasonably thin for, you know, um, for digital switches, they are, um, uh, nano, you know, of, of, today they are of the order of a couple of nanometers at max. You know, it's very, very thin because that gives you a very strong control of the device uh, channel. And, and thermal voltage is, is, is uh, uh, you know, KT by Q. And then there's a Q, extra Q here. So that's your total N sub B. So if you know the dielectric constant of this layer, the thickness of this layer, and the temperature sitting at, you know this parameter. So, right, so yeah, this is NB. So that, that's the first term you have here in the electrostatic you know, control. The second term was NS, uh, which is the, again, the electron sheet density divided by a quantum concentration. Uh, and let me finish this equation and then we write it out again. Uh, times VGS minus a certain threshold voltage that's determined by things like band offsets and, 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 and uh, you know, parameters that don't change with temperature or, or with voltage. So this was the full-blown expression. And uh, N sub Q, this term, is, is given by what we call as a quantum capacitance uh, and uh, times similar. You know? So it's essentially it's the barrier capacitance is the quantum capacitance. And this quantum capacitance happens to be uh, uh, electron charge squared times the density of states. So I'll write it in general like this. Okay? density of states of you know, this two-dimensional electron gas. And the density of states here for the two-dimensional electron gas is just uh, if you know the conduction band effective mass over times uh, you know, spin and value degeneracies. These things you have derived very early on for a 2D system. So that's the density of states 2D system. So if you know the effective mass, spin value degeneracies, uh, then you know CB, uh, CQ. This is, and you can check the units. The units would be, you know, like uh, farads per centimeter square, or farads per meter square if you want to go SI units. And, uh, uh, the CQ is capacitance per unit area. So it, quantum capacitance will have units of farads per meter square. This barrier capacitance will also have the same units, you know, farads per meter square. Right, so. uh, OK, so uh, Q times the, so, so I just wanted to finish this up times kt over q. So you will actually, you know, the q is going to cancel. But, but this is kind of how uh, this quantum ca concentration looks. Uh, the reason for this uh, sort of additional capacitance from a situation, if I had just a metal here and another metal here, and the barrier thickness was just Tb with a dielectric constant of epsilon sub b, then, you know, the parallel plate capacitance between metal, insulator, metal, the parallel plate capacitance, uh, uh, let's call it a total capacitance, would be equal to what? The area, parallel plate capacitor, uh, if I have uh, you know, two metal plates of area A, uh, times the dielectric constant of the intervening dielectric divided by the thickness, right? That's, 
that's your parallel plate capacitance formula. And here we are doing per unit area, so, so that's really our battery capacitance. It's very simple, I mean, nothing fancy. But the reason here, an additional capacitance, which is this you know, density of states related capacitance or quantum capacitance, the reason it appears is because in a parallel plate capacitor with two metals, when I apply, you know, say 0.5 volts across it, then all the voltage has to drop in the dielectric. You know, because no voltage drops in the metal. It is you know, infinitely kind of very, very conductive, so that it doesn't drop any voltage across the metal. But here, in a semiconductor, the density of states of the conduction band or the you know, quantum well in the conduction band is way smaller than the density of states of a metal. Right? Right? Therefore, to put a certain number of carriers in a semiconductor with a finite you know, or low density of states, you also need to drop a certain amount of voltage here. Right? Does that make sense? So, so a little bit of the voltage uh, drops in, in, in the semiconductor, and that part is what is captured by this quantum capacitance, so the density of states capacitance. If you had a semiconductor which has a very high density of states, and the Fermi level kind of is in the, in, inside that band where there's a high density, that's what you call a metal. You know? so, so that's kind of going over in that direction. But because uh, you know, in, a, uh, in, 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 in the semiconductor we are uh, say silicon or gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, we are actually interested in not having a metallic density of states. We are interested in uh, uh, finite but somewhat small density of states. And the reason for that is only then I have this freedom to modulate it by huge amounts. We modulate it by huge amounts. So I can actually do that with available dielectric materials that won't break down and all that. So if I had 10 to the power 14 per centimeter square or 10 to the power 15 per centimeter square electron densities here, today we don't have any solid state dielectrics which can modulate that sort of charge. The fields we'll reach here would be in 10 or 20 megavolt per centimeter and you start breaking down the material. But because in most semiconductors, that's why we use typically about 10 to the power 13 uh, or so, or slightly more, than to, you know, two times 10 to the power 13 per centimeter square, because with that, the dielectrics can sustain this high field that you will ap apply across it to turn it on or off and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So, okay, so that's, that's kind of a, a, a quick sort of summary. Uh, now, this relation uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, so essentially you have you know, these two parameters here and it's transcendental. And what I was uh, trying to get to is there are two limits where you can exactly you know, get an uh, analytical expression. Uh, the limit of, uh, let's look at the limit of very low carrier densities when the electron density is very, very low, you know, on, on, or great voltage is negative. So it's kind of, you know, the voltage is over here. And the Fermi level kind of goes into the gap, you know, below the minimum of the density of states, and then goes into the gap here. So in that case, uh, the uh, the thing is the this this quantity here, VGS minus VT, which is your x-axis, is very large and negative. It's large and negative, or in other words, the the gate voltage is much less than a few thermal KTs, you know, meaning. Uh, so the threshold voltage could be zero depending upon the choice of your band offsets and that such thing. So this whole thing, we consider them together. Uh, and it's large and negative, in which case the right-hand side is, is, a, is a, a pretty small number, right? So e to the power, a large negative number is a very small number, much less than one. Right? And since this is much less than one, we can do some approximations here. And the approximations are, you know, all of them have to be much smaller than one. So you do e to the power x is roughly one plus, you know, x on, the, on this side. And, and, and then uh, what you end up getting is, is uh, you can see you'll get one plus ns over nb and, and plus some higher order terms. And from here, you will get ns over n, this quantum concentration. Uh, because the ones cancel and plus plus some higher order terms, you know, and that will be approximately equal to e to the power VGS minus VT over your thermal voltage. Yeah. And then uh, now you can kind of again expand. Remember, this NS is a is a sheet density; it cannot be negative. It's how many electrons you have per unit area, so, so it cannot be negative. It can be very close to zero; can be 10 to the power minus 12. 
but it can't be negative, right? So, 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 so it's always positive. So as a result, uh, you, you can again say that NS, you know, the, the, the square term is also negligible and you get only the linear order term. NS over the quantum concentration is roughly equal to e to the power, the gate voltage minus the, the, the threshold divided by the thermal voltage here. And therefore the electron density is roughly equal to this quantum concentration and with this exponential. So essentially you're kind of uh, changing the carrier density exponentially here and that's what's happening for very large, you know, for large negative voltages when the device is actually off. And, 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 and it becomes exact, this dashed line is, is an approximation that we just wrote. And the solid line here is exact evaluation and you can see it, it, it kind of exponentially goes down. And, and you can calculate here uh, uh, the amount of voltage that's necessary to drop the carrier density by a factor of 10. You can do, do a log. Uh, so what you can do here is you know, turn this around here and take K, uh, V thermal uh, log about base 10. Um, oh. um, so, so if I want to change the carry density by a factor of 10, the amount of delta VGS I have to apply is, is KT by Q natural log of 10. You can show that very clearly from here. This in quantum doesn't change. And, and, and this thing uh, uh, is uh, roughly 60 millivolts at room temperature. Uh, so, uh, you know, at room temperature, that's 26 millivolts MeV, and then that's natural, it's about 2.3, so, so it becomes 60 millivolts. And so what does, it, what does that mean? It means that uh, uh, if I want to change the carrier density, reduce it by a factor of 10, I must apply 60 millivolts this way, you know, that way. and that changes with temperature. Obviously, at low temperatures, it's much smaller. Right? So, so you go to low temperature, you can go much sharper, the 77 Kelvin, so you can much sharper. Uh, you need much smaller voltage to turn a device from on to off if you are operating at low temperature because the Fermi level is very sharp. So you cannot, the Fermi function becomes very sharp. So, right. And so you can turn it off with a much smaller voltage uh, uh, here. Right. Yeah. Did you make an approximation that NB is much greater than NS? Uh, no, actually there are uh, no approximations made on NB here. NB can be anything for you here. For this one, then why does that disappear? That term? Because uh, it's a good question. But, uh, you know, so because NB, the first, you know, when you multiply all these things out, the first way uh, term it appears in is has square of NS. Yeah? And we're saying the carry density is already very small, so the, we only retain the linear terms. You know? So we throw, we, we only retain this times this and throw everything out because that those are much smaller. That's what, that's approximation. But uh, you can work this out uh, with any, you know, you don't have to make these approximations. What I was trying to say is you can see where the, the dash line is the approximation, the solid is the exact version. You can solve this exactly numerically. So that's uh, actually today's transistors. Uh, 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 this sort of kind of places a very stringent limit. I, I, and I will see in the next step is this is the carrier concentration with gate voltage. This is the current from the source to drain, uh, you know, flowing in the transistor. Uh, and then it's pretty much like a copy of this, except it's, you know, the, the off state is pretty much the same. And, and uh, that's because the current is dependent on how many electrons you have in the conduction band. And, 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 and so, and that's the factor that you are changing exponentially with the gate voltage. How fast the electrons are moving, how slow, you know, what is the groove velocity, the transport, you're changing, but it's not by much. It's not exponential. Uh, it's not, the transport is not being changed exponentially. It's the population of electrons that's being changed exponentially. You know? So, so, so uh, it's not like the mobility goes by five orders of magnitude. It doesn't. Mobility changes by a very small amount or groove velocity changes by a small amount, but the concentration is what you really, really control in these devices. It's population, yeah. Uh, now, uh, the uh, s s second thing is in, in, in the on state, in a very similar way, uh, you can uh, uh, make, uh, so uh, I, I want to kind of uh, just add one more thing. So this is uh, today, uh, for those who work on electronic devices, uh, this poses a very interesting fundamental bottleneck to make transistors any better, you know. Uh, because uh, when, you, when we make a transistor, uh, 
and we use it for digital switching, go from on to off, you know, um, on maybe at about one milliamp per micron and off maybe five, let's say, let's say six or you know, six orders uh, ratio. We, we need this device to have, let's say, six orders of uh, uh, you know, a difference in current, in which case we need uh, six orders, uh, so 60 millivolt per one order or per decade, that's the word used, per decade change in the carrier concentration. So if you want six orders, then you need six times this, right? That much, that's much voltage sweep, right? We must go from this to that, and that would be about 0.36 volts, or let's say roughly 0.4 volts. So uh, uh, now the energy dissipation, energy lost in switching a transistor is proportional to the square of the voltage sweep. And this is very simple idea. The energy in a capacitor is CV squared, right? Uh, and then you recharge, discharge this, this capacitor, in every time you switch on to off, you know, so we, we are kind of uh, changing the gate voltage from very much to the right to the left. Every time you do that, you kind of dissipate this much energy in every switching event. So this, uh, the energy dissipation uh, is, is uh, proportional to CV squared, and therefore, the C, we can't change much, right? I mean, at least in, in this picture, you can see the capacitance kind of fixed. It's this capacitor, barrier capacitor in series, with a tiny quantum capacitance spot here. So that, that I'm not changing. Right? They're fixed by the materials and all that sort of thing. But the voltage you could change, right? You could change. Uh, and, uh, but then you can see that uh, uh, if I reduce the voltage, I, I, I stand to really reduce the dissipation of power and make the energy much more energy efficient, don't need fans, you know, you don't need the laptops don't heat up because all this energy goes out of that he heat. This is dissipated heat. So you know all the cooling requirements for uh, uh, switching with you know when you have a billion of those working in, you know uh, then then a the lot of heat is dissipated, right? So but then you can see that if you reduce the voltage, uh, you are also in a bit of a problem because let's say I say instead of six orders, I'm going to allow do only three orders here. Right? I only only do three orders of on-off ratio. But when you have only three orders, let's say I'm here in on. And when I, my, uh, when I reach off state, I'm only here, uh, you know, so, so three orders would be 180 millivolts. So I can only go like till here and I cannot really switch it off completely. Uh, does that make sense? Right? So, so that's, so that's uh, on the other hand, if I'm here, I can maybe go over here and I, I can maximize my on off, but then I don't have robustness in the on state. The on state is up to change, you know, it's, it's subject to change now. Right? So this is a dilemma, it's called uh, uh, you know, this uh, uh, thermal limit or Boltzmann limit today for all, all the best transistors that we have today. And this is the Boltzmann limit. Uh, and uh, so essentially what I'm saying is uh, if you are limited to a certain voltage swing, uh, uh, you know, it's similar to saying that uh, I, 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 you know, I have a light bulb which is on here, but then when I switch it off, it just becomes a little dimmer. It doesn't really switch off completely. That means it's dissipating a lot of energy anyway, right? So, 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 and that, and ideally, of course, a, the ideal switch would be a unit step function, right? And, and that, 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 and you know, as you freeze something to lower temperature, it starts looking like that, and uh, right, okay. So, uh, so in the on state, uh, is that clear? I just want to kind of get that message out that, that this is a fundamental problem. And anybody who figures out a solution to this uh, would be a, it, it would be a big breakthrough if somebody figures out a solution to this. Yeah. Do they ever build then computers built to operate at a cryogenic temperature for this region? Um, no, absolutely. I mean, you can uh, uh, you, you can build a good computer which works at room temperature a processor and then freeze it to four Kelvin. It gets better. It gets better and better. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, the power dissipation. Uh, Unfortunately, you know, uh, you have to then consider the energy lost in maintaining it at 4 Kelvin. You know? So that's, uh, if, if your ambient is 4 Kelvin, then you can get almost very close to a near ideal switch this way. You know? so, so that's, yeah. uh, right. Uh, so there are many other ways, uh, like interband tunneling is being looked at it, negative capacitance in the gate is being looked at. Some, some of these things are being looked at today to how to make it steeper. You know? so, but that, that's an active area of research today, very active area of research. And the problem, the heart of the problem is this. It's exactly this, essentially Fermi function, the tail, and uh, the, the, the voltage required for changing the carrier concentration or the current 
by significant orders of magnitude at room temperature. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the one more thing I want to add here is uh, very similar to what we did here for off state, uh, we can go to uh, on state. And uh, the other kind of thing that sometimes missed out is in the on state of a transistor, we want a very high current typically. And, and the reason for that is this is the power dissipation and the speed at which you can switch at any sort of a capacitor resistor circuit uh, is capacitance times voltage divided by the current. This is just you know very simple RLC picture. Uh, yeah, yeah. So so C CV over I, uh, you know charge over current is time. So uh, so this is called a delay of a transistor. So um, so I need a very large current to be able to switch things fast. And in a transistor operation, the performance of a transistor, the uh, amount of crunch, number crunching capability and computational capability is, you know, is higher if you have a lower tau. You, know, you can switch faster. So, uh, so, so that's why, uh, again, CVs, you can see we are kind of locked with a certain voltage now and capacitance I can't change much, so you can improve the current to improve the performance. You know, so. And, and that's uh, done. And so, for example, for the microprocessors today, the current, uh, uh, the on currents are typically about a milliamp per micron, uh, which you will get out of ballistic transistor calculation directly. It's milliamp per micron uh, width, and uh, um, and then that leads to uh, sub picoseconds. So the delays, if you do the numbers for a normal FET, uh, I don't know. I'm just going to give you a rough order of magnitude, 0.5 picoseconds is how fast you can t switch a good transistor today. Uh, 0.5 picoseconds, so you know, uh, 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So that's really fast. Uh, and uh, the delays, uh, the transistors today are extremely fast. The delays are mostly when one transistor wants to talk to another, which is across, you know, half a centimeter across the chip. So that's an interconnect delay. That signal has to go through a metal wire. And uh, uh, if it was light, it would go at speed of light. But if you do the numbers, even that, that is a limitation, actually. So it's just, you know, basically, the transistor switches very, very fast. And it's most of the time, it's just waiting for the next job. You know? and, and, and so that's kind of a very interesting uh, problem. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, and, uh, so essentially, what I'm saying is computation can be done extremely fast. But this is not, you know, not, not necessarily a limit either. So, so it could be made better. But today, people are not too worried about making that faster because most of the times it's just waiting, doing nothing because it, the communication is weak. You know, it, that's the bottleneck today. So, so uh, 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 okay. So, so the uh, on state of the device. Uh, let's look at that. That n in the on state. This term is very, very. It's it's larger than V thermal. So this term becomes much larger. And e to the power a large number here. And uh, when you have e to the power a large number on the right side, I can throw this minus one out. I don't need that. And I bec uh, the equation then becomes, let me write this down here. It's actually very close to being exact, but uh, now we can make that approximation. And now you can uh, you know, invert or take the log natural log on both sides. And uh, I'll just you know rewrite it in this way, and you can show that this is uh, how it will turn up to be. Over Q, wow. right? So so you will get you know when I have two capacitors in series, the barrier capacitance, and this is what we call as the density of states of the quantum capacitance. When I have the two in series, then the total, you know, capacitance is the series connection of two capacitors. Right? So, so this is how it appears. A so part of the voltage drops in the uh, semiconductor, that's taken care of this by this, and the part of it in the dielectric, which is taken care of this. Right? So, so, so that's your voltage division, uh, and you can see the carrier density is kind of linearly proportional to the gate voltage minus the threshold. You know, so, so, right. In the on state, yeah. What limit is this? In? Ah, yeah. So this is the on state, meaning uh, when the gate voltage minus the threshold is much larger than the thermal voltage. So, so, uh, on the right side of that curve, you might. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so so uh, and, and 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 then so when you plot the carrier density versus uh, VGS minus VT, uh, so it it will look. Uh, if I just plot this, then then you know it it, it it will look like that. But if I actually plot the log scale, you know the exact expression of it, uh, we saw the log scale looks exponential. Uh, sorry, exponential. And then it is, so, you know, again, I, I don't, so this is the linear scale, it will look like it's turning on here, but in log scale, it actually, you know, when it goes, turns off, it, it really goes down exponentially, it doesn't go to zero. No, so, so it's just exponential. I just wanted to kind of, like, you, you guys are plotting this stuff in your assignments. So. Um, now, uh, I want to do, uh, uh, finish up this discussion by going to the current, but I wanted to emphasize that the current part is much easier than the electrostatic. We, we have done the hard work now, the current is simpler. Uh, the picture we, uh, we we have here is is that uh, uh, the uh, gate is controlling the electron density in the in the two-dimensional electron gas, which is here. And uh, let me just bring up the picture one more time, and we can uh, look at that. So um, so as the gate. Um, uh, if I have just zero volts on both the source and drain, then the gate starts populating the electron states. Uh, if I apply gate voltage, it becomes a capacitor, and it fills up states in the case space of the electron. And the electron conduction band in the effective mass approximation, we can write down that the EK is you know, conduction band edge plus some ground state for the quantum well, plus H square, you know, K square, KX square plus KY square by mass. Right? That's the parabolic dispersion of the conduction band states, the K states. And when I apply a gate voltage, uh, uh, which is positive, then it starts populating electrons. And the right going electrons, you know, going in, 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 in towards from the source to the drain, uh, come from the source contact. You know, the source contact injects those carriers and fills those states. The drain uh, injects the left going carriers and it fills those. So this is kind of a ballistic picture. There's no mixing of the two. Does that make sense? And they, they inject equally because both of them have the same potential. Right? And how much they inject is controlled by the gate voltage. And that's exactly, you know, the total area must be equal to whatever I solve for NS here as a function of gate voltage. Does that make sense? I mean, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the picture uh, we want to have in mind. And once we have that picture in mind, calculating the current becomes easier now. Uh, uh, and the most important part of the three-terminal aspect of the transistor, which gives you gain and gives you, you know, this uh, output isolation and, and uh, current saturation and all that, is when I apply a drain voltage, um, so what was a symmetric distribution earlier, the source injected and the drain e injected equally, so that's why it's symmetric. And once I apply a drain voltage, I pull the conduction band of this side down. Right, if I apply positive, I pull it down. It becomes much harder for the drain to inject the left going states now, right? Because it has to have a lot more energy now. Right? It becomes, you know, equal to the, how much harder energetically unfavorable it is. It's Q times VDS. That's the drain source voltage now. Does that make sense? You pulled it down. So the Fermi tail here. Uh, that that was going to inject these left going carriers suddenly shrunk, so it became smaller. Okay. Now the source. Now this is the tricky part about the, uh, 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 or rather, uh, the, uh, this is also the heart of the transistor. W w on the other hand, the source. You would think that oh, the source is injecting equally now. I mean, it, it has nothing has changed for it, right? The barrier hasn't changed, but that's not quite true. In the transistor. The total electron density at this point here, where you know the gate is, is controlled not by the source or the drain. It is completely controlled by the gate. The gate controls what is the area of these two half circles or half. You know, does that make sense? The gate has complete control over it. If it does not have a complete control over it, it's not a good transistor. So, so this is where you completely isolate the effect of the drain on the current from the, from the gate effectively. So, so uh, in other words, if I, my gate bias stays fixed and my drain voltage was zero first, and then I have this situation in case space, right? Then I apply, say, 0.5 volts on the drain, right? Then the distribution must become like this, but the area must remain exactly the same. And that's controlled by the gate. That, that, that's kind of the, uh, so the gate controls the total number of carriers at this, what's called as the injection point, uh, where 
the conduction band is flat here. It's called the injection point. And the electrons that are being injected, so th therefore, the source has to inject a little more, right, to, to make up for the reduction from the drain. And, and, and therefore, the, uh, you know, and, and as a result, the source Fermi level has to change. Does that make sense? To be able to inject more, it has to change. And, 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 and so, uh, and you can see there'll be, a, that's, if, if, if there, there, there's some notion of gain here because uh, uh, what will happen is, is, is this uh, source Fermi level as a result becomes very much dependent on the gate voltage. Uh, uh, and it, the gate doesn't mess with the drain, drain uh, Fermi level at all. So, so with these boundary conditions, you can now calculate all these curves of current. Because you know, calculating the electron density is, is essentially finding the area here. And calculating the current is taking the, each K point, taking a you know, uh, group velocity, taking a projection of the velocity along that direction, and just integrating over the whole thing. right? And you, uh, the best way to do it is you break it up into two, two, two halves, the right going and the left going. And then, uh, uh, and then, then, then essentially the drain kind of, uh, the drain uh, causes a you know, m m uh, imbalance of these two. And then from there you can calculate the current. Yeah, there was a question. Yeah, can you explain again the, which side corresponds to the drain as well? Ah, okay. So, uh, so this side is positive Kx. So, I mean, uh, so th those electrons are going to the right. Uh, and and th the electrons that are going to the right could have come only from the source contact uh, if they're ballistic, you know, if they're moving ballistically, meaning electron moving this way doesn't scatter and turn around. So uh, electron going to the right could have come only from the source contact. So right going carriers are in equilibrium with the source contact. And the left-going carriers have come from the drain, so they are in equilibrium with the drain contact. You know, so they, when we say they're in equilibrium, we mean they share the same uh, Fermi level as the source and the drain. Right? Yeah. Just to understand the point further, the point you were just making about the increase in Fermi level on the source side. Yeah. You said that that was because the gate should be the only thing that controls the density of electrons in the channel. Uh, at 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 this 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 uh, if there was no drain voltage, then you know the band would be flat, so it controls the density everywhere. But you know at a point where the band uh, right, so this is called the source injection point where the it's called the top of the barrier or where the slope of this is zero. That's that's the point where it controls it. Yeah, go ahead. Well, so what is the mechanism by which we increase the Fermi level? Because it must increase to keep the density mm -hmm. constant. But what is the mechanism, uh, like a mechanistic explanation, of why the Fermi level increases? Ah, the yeah, side? that's a good point. So you can think that uh, uh, the <coughs> so uh, so actually the the, uh, the electrons that are here are really have come from the metal, right? So we have kind of said. We have applied a positive voltage. We have pulled out electrons from the metal, and we're trying to inject it into this region. And and uh, uh, so the, the 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 number of electrons that are coming from the source side is much larger than the one coming from the drain side because this barrier is high. And uh, uh, f physically, if my gate was very very far away, then it would be very difficult to do what I'm saying. You know, meaning the gate must be very close, such that it controls the potential of this region to be able to, uh, you know, to, to be able to maintain this situation. If I, uh, maybe I'm not answering question. Your question is, how are the electrons getting there? Or uh, yeah. Just why did the Fermi level on the source side increase? Oh, I see. Okay, so you know, okay, electrostatically, the gate uh, terminal. Let's uh, draw draw this. <coughs> So the, the actually voltages everywhere in this uh, structure are, let's look at this structure. Here's, let's say, our oxide or dielectric. Here's the gate metal. And here's my source injection point, you know, N plus, let's say. And, and so when I apply a positive gate voltage uh, here, uh, it means that, you know, this whole plate is positively charged now. Okay. And, and, and then the rest of the electrons are sitting here the, uh, or, or distributed in some way across. 
And so there's actually electric field starting out from here, and it, it, it kind of, if, if I have a band diagram that looks like this, uh, the elect electric field, where, which I'm not really getting into, has a pretty interesting shape. No? And so electrostatically, this region, the potential of it is controlled also by the gate. It's coupled to the gate capacitively through, this is the kind of your CGS capacitance. So it, it kind of moves with that potential. We, do, we typically do that more in a device physics course, so where we draw the, all these structures, solve Poisson equation and all that, and calculate those things also. But, but it, is, it, it, it is controlled by the gate voltage because it's ca ca capacitively coupled to it too, this source injection point. So. Okay, so uh, uh, I wanted to uh, then finish up this discussion by saying that uh, you know, I, 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 one of the nice ways to look at this problem is to think of electrons as uh, you know, partly uh, this is kind of the right-going electrons, if you might, electron density, and this is the left-going electron density, right? Right. And even when you don't have a drain voltage, you can think of them like that, right? And then the sum of them. Uh, and right going plus and left going is equal to the total sheet density that we have found before. Right? It's just that we are saying that the left going ones have come from the drain, therefore they have a Fermi level which is of the drain. These have come from the source, so they have a Fermi level of the source, they're in equilibrium with the source. Right? So that's, that's one way to look at it. And from here you can kind of uh, very nicely write that uh, the right going carriers if I know where's the Fermi level, uh, here's your two-dimensional electron gas, you know. Uh, so I if you r work through this, you will get E to the power of Fermi level uh, minus E0 over KT, Boltzmann T. So this is your exact expression for the 2D uh, sheet density as a function of where is the Fermi level corresponding to the you know, ground state E0. So Fermi level minus where the density of state starts at that energy. So that's the exact expression. Essentially, this is the zeroth order Fermi Dirac integral, which is exactly doable. We did that in the last class. And from here, uh, uh, you can see that uh, that would be the total carrier density. But now I'm going to split it into two, a right going and a left going. Right? I'm going to split it into two and say that uh, uh, I'm going to just write the right going part first, and that you can see right away I should have a half here. Right? I, I should have a half because I'm going to sum the two, and then this will right going ones have come from the source, so I put the formula, quasi Fermi level of the source here. Right? And left going states is quantum carry concentration over two, one plus e to the power of Fermi drain minus e zero over k b t. Right? Exactly what I did, I just kind of split them uh, conceptually first and then quantitatively next, right? So split them into two, 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 two halves. If there was no drain voltage, these two would be exactly the same and you sum them and you'll get the total carry concentration, right? So, so, yeah. uh, and, uh, but now, uh, if I sum them, you can see that there's an interesting sort of a, a product which is a uh, natural log of this plus natural log of that. So that would be a, you know, get multiplied inside EFS minus E0 over KT. E Fermi of drain minus E0 over KB of T. Okay. So, so that's how your carrier density now depends on the source Fermi level and the drain Fermi level. Source Fermi level and the drain Fermi levels. Uh, uh, that's how it, 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 it kind of, uh, so essentially oh, this is just the sum of this, this and this, right? So, but what we are saying is for this to be a good transistor, uh, uh, this quantity must be completely controlled by the gate. It must be completely controlled by the gate. And how is it controlled by the gate? We already have that here. Right? This expression is what gives you how the gate controls the n, n sub s, right? So, 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 so uh, now uh, I'm going to kind of uh, essentially most of the interesting physics of semiconductors, especially when things change exponentially, uh, happens in the exponential space or not in, you know, the, so essentially you take a e to the power on both sides and you end up with a e to the power Fermi level of source minus 
over kt 1 plus e to the power Fermi level of drain minus e0 of kvt is equal to it just e to the power that thing here mm, no sorry 2 times ns over mq so i just inverted this here and and uh, uh, one more thing we know is uh, what is the Fermi level of source minus Fermi level of drain. Right, that's the source drain voltage, right? Source drain voltage is uh, times the electron charge is the Q. Uh, so that's really just the, that's the definition. When you apply it's the voltage uh, between source and drain, that's the uh, thing. So I can, instead of writing it as EFD, I can write it as uh, is EFS S minus zero minus Q times VDS, right? Just re rewrite it, just change it to one variable uh, which is unknown now. And, 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 uh, and then we're gonna make a couple of, uh, uh, so this quantity uh, I referred to in the notes that uh, uh, you have now as eta sub S, just, you know, uh, for, for uh, easier, this as v small v ds small v or let's let's call it small v sub d. These are all dimensional parameters now, right? The energy over kt, qv over kt. This is, this is how we have written in the notes, and then so your, this expression just uh, uh, becomes e to the power eta sub s one plus e to the power eta sub s minus v d is equal to. This is N, carrier concentration over quantum, quantum, quantum density. And you can see that this is a, uh, this equation, when you solve it, you can find what is eta sub s as a function of the carrier density, which depends on the gate voltage. So, so that's kind of the twisted thing, and, and you have to do it self consistently. Uh, but once you do that, uh, you notice that this is actually a quadratic equation because you know, this is the unknown. Uh, e to the power thing, and then and, and so if you say this is x, you get uh, you know x square. You can rewrite the whole thing out. You get an expression for the uh, for the uh, Fermi level of the source as a function of the gate voltage. Now you can find the whole thing out. I'm not trying to solve this whole thing out for you now, but uh, I'll just uh, show you how it looks, and uh, you can uh, and you can uh, mm, apply that to to your problem that you're doing here. Oops, where is that? <laughs> yeah, so it's in this chapter. Um, and um, right, so we talked about these figures. And, and uh, um, the, the, this is the expression I was mentioning, you know, so you can, and, and then when you o open out the quadratic, you get this whole kind of expression. Essentially, I'm saying you can, you can get the source Fermi level now as a function of two things, the drain voltage and the gate voltage. And those are the two things that control all operations of the transistor. So you have the entire operation, uh, you know, um, regime of the transistor buried in, in this form now. It's a little, you know, twisted, but, but you can work through it and, and see uh, uh, how, how. So it explains both the on state and the off state. And uh, uh, the, the second thing which I leave for you to do uh, is I did not try to write down the full expression for the current, but it's written here. All you're doing is you're summing over all these, you know, right going states and the left going group velocities and you're finding, you'll find the current would be proportional to the half order for meter rack integral. It's an exact expression. There's no approximations here. And, and uh, uh, from, from our expression that we have uh, already talked about it. And effective mass of the band appears here. This is the effective mass picture. And uh, it's a Fermi Dirac integral of order half. And when you make a plot of this now, uh, uh, you, you, will, uh, you can ask it to plot. Uh, so, so again, so w how, how would I go about plotting it? Uh, I would say that uh, give me a gate voltage, or, or fix the drain voltage first, say 0.5 volts. 
and then I can sweep the gate voltage and find out, you know, I have to solve that equation to uh, find out at any gate voltage what is the carry density or what is the current. There's a, we have derived an expression for it is what I'm trying to say now. And you have to solve it and then uh, uh, self-consistently because it's a transcendental equation. You, can't, you know, don't have an exact solution to it. But uh, uh, if you're using MATLAB or Python or Mathematica, uh, you know, it's a transcendental. It can solve it numerically. It's not a problem. You know? Uh, you just have to be a little careful with uh, dealing with giving it arguments that don't have very large numbers. You know, just non-dimensionalize everything. Th does that make sense? I mean, so so expo it doesn't like you. You may run into problems if you ask it to do e to the power. For example, 0.2 volts. VGS minus VT is 0.2 volts, but that's uh, if I, if my thermal voltage is 26 millivolts. So that's 200 millivolts. So that's e to the power 10 already, roughly, right? So that's a large number. So it may complain if you go too far to the right or left. But at least this part, it should be able to pull out nicely. The second very important thing, so this is the log scale of the drain current versus gate voltage. And it's on and off. <coughs> Linear scale, it kind of goes this way. And this is the characteristic of our N, N MOS, or our N channel transistor. When you are applying positive gate voltage, the transistor opens and starts conducting, right? If we do the same thing with a valence band, right? If you, instead of electron gas, I have whole gas, you can see that everything will flip around. So I will be off when I have positive voltage, but I'll turn on when I have negative voltage. No? So that's a PMOS, or uh, where you're using holes uh, instead of electrons for, for, for your transistor. And similarly, this will turn on this way. And, 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 and in, in your expressions, instead of the conduction band effective mass, you must use the valence band effective mass now because it's the valence band that's doing the transport. The last thing is, uh, I mentioned earlier, this fact that the current saturates is very, very important for electronics, uh, for, for cascading, for fan out, meaning one transistor can drive 100 or 1,000. And the fact that it saturates is extremely important for that purpose. And this, this is also what gives gain to this semiconductor. Uh, and the reason it saturates, you can, you can imagine that uh, uh, as, as I increase my drain voltage, uh, so here's a certain drain voltage, uh, and I increase it further, I have something like that, increase it further, I have something like that. It, it is becoming harder and harder, increasingly harder for, el for electrons to go from the drain to the source, right? Uh, from drain. Uh, so, so essentially, what that means is that a small drain voltage, I may have a distribution that may look like this, but the, remember the area is still being controlled by the gate. It's fixed, right? And then I apply more drain voltage, so that shrinks, and this grows a little bit again. And finally, this will pretty much go away, right? But this, so all the carriers are pretty much going to the right, and, 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 and that area is still controlled by the gate. Right? And, and therefore, uh, so the current saturates, uh, and, and, and then uh, the only way you can change the current now is if you change the gate voltage, because then you make this thing bigger or smaller. Make sense. So, so that's the meaning of current saturation. Uh, so for small devices, for uh, low power devices, uh, this is the correct way to think of it. Current saturates at the source injection point, you know, before, uh, at the point where the electrons are getting into the channel uh, of the transistor, which is, which is you know, kind of uh, right here. So all this action I mentioned is happening right here in, in the, at, the, at this source injection point. There are a lot of other things going on. The carry distribution, as you might imagine, would be very different if you are here. Here, it's much easier for the drain to get in, right? But the way you will have a lot of left-going carriers at this point, right? But you will have fewer right-going carriers, but the right-going carriers have very high velocities, you know, so they balance out. So, so, so you still have, a, so the current is always continuous. The current here is equal to current here, current is here, and all that, right? So as I move away from this uh, point, the distribution changes in you know, ways that you need more numerical solution and all that. But at this point, it's, it's analytical. You can get what, what we just wrote down, you know, so we can get the whole thing. OK, so how do you then track? Uh, so if I have, on the other hand, other applications, this is a ballistic model. Uh, you have long channel devices where you have mobilities and scattering and all that sort of thing. If I have scattering, then we need this Boltzmann transport equation to solve for it. This is a long channel model. That's how most of the transistor design was done for, you know, f has been done for a very long time. And, uh, and, and also when I have uh, what you call as high voltage transistors, where you switch hundreds of volts or thousands of volts, uh, typically a lot of, you know, current saturation happens because of 
some other reasons, and then that happens on the drain side, not on the source side. But for ballistic devices, which are operating close to the quantum limits, it happens. What, that, what we have discussed that here, and we, I'm not discussing too much about the high voltage, you know, uh, aspect of this picture. So, so that, that happen, uh, there, a lot of things happen on the drain side of it, and many of the approximations we talked about may or may not work. For example, there's a lot more mixing of carriers of left and left right going states because there's scattering turned on and other things like that. So yeah. yeah. So in previous explanations, I had seen that the saturation of the current as a function of the drain source voltage mm -hmm. occurred as a result of channel pinch off. Good, that's right. So it's just interesting that this is leading to the same effect that we didn't pretty much, yeah. touch on pinch uh, off. So it's the same effect that's right. not related phenomena. That's right. So electrostatically, uh, you're, you know, that, that, so these are, there is still pinch off in this st structure, except, uh, uh, so, so, so uh, you're right. So, so uh, traditionally, the way we look at it is if I had, you know, a uh, very classical picture of the device, so I have a, uh, let's say, oxide and a gate metal. Right, and I apply voltage. I'm depleting something here, but the source is grounded, and the drain has a large voltage. So this diode has a larger voltage drop. So as a result, you know, if, if I'm so this is a depletion region, no carriers here, and the electrons are going this way. Let's say, right? But then, because this has a larger voltage drop, you're going to kind of as you increase the drain voltage, you're going to kind of finally pinch off the channel here. So that's that's uh, so electrostatically, this effect is also happening in in this ballistic fed. But in the ballistic fed, uh, the, you know, uh, here you need this mobility or the continuous drop of, of uh, so this, is, uh, this picture is accurate when you have a lot of scattering in the channel. If I don't have any scattering, then the electrostatics has to be done slightly differently. You know? And then the pinch off, there is effectively also a pinch off there, except the carriers that are in that region are moving very, very fast. You know? So the saturation actually occurs in a ballistic fed First of all, it occurs, right? We measure it, right? So, so, and this is a physical reason for it. Ballistic model gives you a very simple picture of why, why it should saturate. You know, by looking at this, so slightly different picture, though. Actually, quite a bit different picture, not slightly. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what I wanted to uh, do next, and, and and you know, when you plot these things, uh, um, so this these two characteristics: the drain current versus the gate voltage, and the drain current versus the drain voltage. If you are able to plot it. And you see this exponential turn off and the you know current saturation at drain voltage uh, so you that's that's uh, at least today I would say that's the state of the art understanding of a of the you know complete quantum theoretical model of a transistor today you know? so so that's uh, and 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 it's uh, uh, there are simpler models which can explain one thing but not the other for example if you uh, do not consider the quantum capacitance in this electrostatics. It's it's very difficult to explain why it should the current should go down exponentially. You, know, you will get the on state right, so you will get one extreme. Uh, 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 so if you look at uh, so some books would cover this part prim uh, uh, primarily, uh, which is you know not, doesn't explain the log scale, you know the exponential decay, but the picture we covered uh, gives you a full blown expression for. For uh, you know, transistor operation, field effect transistor operation under all conditions. Now, if I, if my source to drain distance is very long, then there's a chance that the electron can, um, instead of going ballistically, it can scatter with the crystal, with defects, and all that sort of thing. And its electron momentum, uh, the momentum of the electron, uh, can get defaced. It can get turned around. It can backscatter, you know, because of some uh, phonons or, 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 or defects. Uh, what that changes is the transport picture, but it completely does not change this picture. This picture stays the same because, you know, it's electrostatics. It is, you know, it, this. The, if I have 10 to the power 12 electrons per centimeter square in the metal, uh, the gate metal, I must have 10 to the power 12 in the semiconductor too, right? I mean, there's no way around it. That's just like charge neutrality and electrostatics. So. Uh, uh, so in a ballistic transistor, you 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 uh, take the quantum expression for velocity, which is the group velocity, and you you know use this and and sum over all states, and you get the total current. In a uh, if you have a lot of scattering, then you solve. Uh, I'm going to write that down now. Uh, we solve the Boltzmann transport equation, and you have to introduce the scattering into the picture, and and uh, invoke the concept of mobility or saturation velocity and such things. Uh, uh, which depend on defects 
and phonons and such things. Now, till now we have not talked about it. We have gotten away by just looking at electrons in a perfect crystal, right? Uh, which gave us the band structure. Uh, but uh, regardless, so, so once we find this, uh, you know, um, uh, so the current is, is uh, we have uh, written, so I, I'll just write it a general form. Uh, we have spins and valleys and all that, but essentially we are summing over dKs for, let's do two dimensional because we're talking about two dimensional electron gas. We sum over group velocities, right, along a certain direction times of occupation function. That's, that's how we're getting the current, there's electron charge sum over all k states, group velocity times occupation function. And we got, uh, uh, so, so essentially this occupation function, uh, if I do this, d squared k over 2 pi whole squared, and I just integrate not the group velocity but just the occupation function, what should I get here for the transistor? Right? So physically what am I doing here? I'm just summing over counting how many electrons there are. So what should I get? I should get just that expression, right? Whatever this gives me, right? Uh, right? This is just the electron dense, sheet density. You can see units also, K is one over length, so it's one over centimeter square, so you get that, yeah. Yeah? Oh, so the two pi squared should technically be two pi over L upon a squared, but you move the L to Yeah, L yeah, L right, L right, L so it should be two pi by L. Uh, and and uh, physically, actually, a transistor uh, is not quite L, but it, ha it may have different width and length in this direction. It's W by L. So it's actually uh, Kx divided by 2 pi by L, Ky divided by 2 pi W, but the area is W times L, so it's sheet density per unit area. You know? so, so we took that out. So that's the electron density, and that's the current, the total current. And you can see the current density for a 2D electron gas would be current per unit width. You know? So total amps per unit width, so you'll get, uh, the units typically use is milliamp per micron or uh, you know, amps per millimeter, something like that. Right? So, so this is the typical units used. A good on-state current uh, for a on-state current is roughly one milliamp per micron. You can get a little more, in, uh, but in silicon MOSFETs and all, it's about one milliamp per micron. And you will, when you derive, uh, when you calculate this in your assignment, you'll get this value. So, yeah. so uh, now, uh, uh, the way we got around in this ballistic picture is basically we said that from physical intuition and say, thinking about what ballistic actually means, we were able to say what this f of k is, right? right? We said that f of k is such that all the right going states have Fermi function. Uh, uh, so the right going states have Fermi function that looks e to the power energy of conduction band plus h square, you know, k square by twice effective mass of conduction band minus, this is the total kinetic energy, minus the Fermi, Fermi uh, energy of the source, or the Fermi level of the source over kBT, right? Does that make sense? I mean, this is, this is in equilibrium, right going stairs are in equilibrium with the source. So we wrote that. In fact, uh, this should be a little different, so. See, let's write it as E0. And then, then we took this E0 minus EFS and all that. So. And, and similarly, this thing is for the, for, the, for the drain. And then we kind of sum two components. One is right going current, the left going current, and the difference is the total current. Right? So, so that's what you do for ballistic. But for the most general case, when you have scattering and stuff turned on, the distribution function in K space, KY and KX, would look very different. You know, electrons that were in the ballistic picture, what this means is, is I have electrons that are injected that have velocities, uh, you know, quite a few of them have velocities in that direction, some of them have that direction, some of them, uh, you know, so it, it is essentially you are injecting a half circle here, right? The Ks, uh, Kx values like that, Ky, you know, and, and some of them are going this way and some of them are going that way. So that's your distribution of electrons in, 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 into, the, into the channel. Uh, and, and, and then there are some which are going to the left, but you know, when you saturate, all of them are going to the right like that. Right? Now, for, and, and, and then what we are doing here is we are taking the x component of all of them and finding out what's the total x component of the current, right? Because the total y component will always go to, I mean, cancel out exactly. There's no potential difference in the y direction, right? So cancel out. Uh, now, for, for when I, whenever I turn on scattering, uh, things get much more messier. Uh, you know, so, so instead of 
a distribution like this, it may, you know, it, it may become a little more, uh, you know, much more smoother, you know, and, and, and uh, I, I, you know, it depends. So it may become something like that now. So the distribution function changes. Because of scattering, you know, electrons that were uh, going ballistically this way can maybe scatter there, scatter there. So there's a lot of mixing now, intermixing of the states. And, and uh, how do you find this distribution function when I have a non-equilibrium situation like this, I have a drain pulling electrons, the gate controls how much there are and all that. So that, how do you find the distribution function in a, any general case is what's the Boltzmann transport equation. That's, what you have, that's the equation you have to solve to get the most general distribution function under all conditions. You can turn on scattering, or if you turn it off, you get the ballistic limit. You know, so, right? so, so that's the meaning of Boltzmann transport equation. And uh, this equation is, is, uh, is, is, is actually, uh, uh, let me say first what you're going to get, and then we do, uh, do, do the problem. So you may imagine that uh, the total distribution function in the end will be equal to whatever you have at equilibrium and at equilibrium, the distribution function is the Fermi-Dirac distribution. That's the meaning of Fermi-Dirac distribution, it's the equilibrium distribution function. And then there will be a little tweak to it, right? A little tweak to it, uh, uh, not little, I mean, it could be big, but uh, the tweak will look like this. It will look like Q times, uh, uh, you know, group velocity dot product with a force. Uh, and there'll be a certain scattering rate just write it here, tau, which is a scattering rate, and there'll be a distribution. Uh, this is an approximation, and I'll explain what this means now. Okay? So, so I'll have a derivative of the distribution function, or, or the Fermi function. That's how it's going to look. Uh, and uh, um, physically what it means is whatever force you apply, this is the force. Could be due to electric field or magnetic field or things like that. The force uh, that you apply is pulling the distribution function away from the, distrib uh, from the equilibrium uh, Fermi Dirac distribution. This pulls it out. And this is the, uh, 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 now in terms of energy, it is a derivative of the uh, Fermi function, and that's the part that's going to give you a net current. So, because if you take just the Fermi Dirac distribution and you integrate it over all k space, you'll always get a zero, right? Because you get, it's a symmetric function with k. Right. It's k squared here, so it's symmetric function. Whereas this is what's going to give you the asymmetry that will give you the current. This is something we talked about very early in the course, right? So when you, when you have equal number of right and left going carriers, which is ensured by the Fermi drag distribution, you'll get no current. But if you have unequal, this is the unequal part. You know? uh, that's what we're going to get now, yeah. Yeah, energy. So that's right. Uh, and uh, you know, this part is uh, written up in one of the chapters in more detail. So I'll you know explain now what it is. Okay. So let me be clear. I, I, let me keep it epsilon here because it is this component of the energy. It's just the kinetic part of energy. Epsilon of k, if you might, is eight square k square by twice the conduction band effective mass or valence band effective mass. So that's the part. But then there is also the other part, which is the band edge and all that, so, so there's, that's the total energy, but this is just the kinetic part of it. Um, and, and you know, just in terms of units, that's a force, and velocity is length time, over time. Time and this tau cancel, so you get energy, and energy, so, you know, distribution function, it's, it's, you can check, it's, it'll, be, it'll be still dimensionless. Distribution function has no units, right? Occupation probability has no units. Uh, so, so this is what we're going to get, and then when I go, I'm going to use it physically, uh, this part is always, you know, symmetric around k is equal to zero, or symmetric uh, for left and right going carriers. Whereas this part is is the derivative, so it's always by definition it's uh, you know, it, it is asymmetric, so it will look like that. It's the derivative of f naught with uh, either energy or k, whichever way you choose. Uh, you'll see that, uh, so as a result, when I take the integral of this, even at non-equilibrium, my electron density, I'm going to sum a symmetric part plus an asymmetric part, right? And you can see that one of them must be zero here, right? And which one would be zero here? Uh, this part, right? Is you're summing just that function, right? It's just be zero. Uh, and this one will give you the electron density. So what it's trying to say is, if I pull the Fermi 
the, the electron distribution away from equilibrium, I still have the same number of electrons. It's not like I've changed it. It's just I've changed its distribution in the K space. That's all I've done, right? right? So, so this is ensured by the gate part of it. Whereas here, you can see this is the group velocity, and that is h bar times k over m star c for a parabolic band, right? In which case, this is k, and that's, uh, uh, so essentially this, as a function of k now, will be linear. So it's a, you know, this odd function. So this multiplies with this. It makes it odd. So this integral will go to 0, whereas this will survive. Right? So the transport is because of this term. And the electrostatic carry density is because of that term. Right? So, so that's how it just breaks up now when, when you have a non-equilibrium situation. Right? And then so Boltzmann transport uh, essentially gives you how to do this. Uh, and let me just say it's, it's a conceptually a very important uh, uh, parameter if you want to understand the effect of scattering and equilibrium and such things. You know, so it's conceptually, that's a very important thing. For the ballistic FET, you are kind of getting around it without knowing by making good guesses on, in some parts of the device. You know, so, yeah. uh, so I will outline the Boltzmann transport, uh, you know, the formalism, what it is, and, and, uh, uh, and then we uh, can apply that to, uh, let's so let's see, Boltzmann transport equation, the, the, once we get the physical field for what it is, uh, you know, the, the mathematical part is, you know, this part will come out naturally, but let's look at physically what it's saying. Uh, so uh, if we look at the transistor at every point in space, uh, you know, conduction band looked something like that, which was changing with R, or, sp or let's call it one dimensional for now, X. And at each point in the conduction band, I maybe have a quantum well, and I have a 2D electron gas, and I have a band structure that would give me a certain E of k, which would look like, you know, let's write this, uh, you know, uh, a square k square by twice the effective mass of the conduction band. And then there's a, maybe a minimum here, which is the ground state. Physically, what, what does it mean? It means that the electron energy uh, profile is changing both in space and in k, right? both in x and k, physically, right? So, so uh, uh, at every x, I can have different k's, right? And at, uh, at, 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 at a, a particular, uh, if I choose a particular k, you know, let's say this is a k, that's another k, and they can be the same, but they can be at different x's. Does that make sense? So this is what's called the phase space. There are different x values, there are different k values, and there are electrons distribute, you know, distributed in this space somehow, right? right? And so at L, each point here, I have a certain occupation function. So f at x, k, and time, bring in time now. There's a certain occupation function in, in space space. Now if we look at classical mechanics, uh, your x and k can be absolutely precisely defined. Right? You can determine its location and momentum exactly at any point of time with no uncertainty, so it's a point. In quantum mechanics, we have this uncertainty relation that it's spread out a little bit this way, spread out a little bit this way. So there's a little bit of a blob here you know, so in quantum mechanics. But we already have taken that part into account. We have already said that our case, we have composed it with a wave packet, so we have some sort of a wave packet. So essentially, we have said that there is you know, this effective mass. Once you're in the effective mass theory, you already have taken into account that there's a delta k, and there's also a delta x. Whatever be it, there's a little blob here, and, and, uh, uh, and the, you can go with x plus some delta x, k plus some delta k around it, and find out what's the occupation function of that. Just spread out. Uh, and so, uh, so the Boltzmann uh, equation really tells you how is it, how is this function determined by external forces, the electric field or concentration gradients, thermal gradients. If you shine light on it or anything like that, how, how does this change? Right? So, so if, if you, uh, and, and the first uh, thing uh, about the Boltzmann transport equation is if you don't do anything, then your equilibrium distribution function is the Fermi Dirac distribution. That's the you know steady state or the, the, the equilibrium solution, and that looks like h square k square by twice effective mass over k k b t. Right. So we know the solution for equilibrium. That's physically what I'm trying to say. Here's the x dependence. 
here is the k dependence and no change in no dependence on time that's the meaning of equilibrium nothing is changing with time does that make sense i mean so so there's no time in, on the right side this is in equilibrium right now uh, when i turn on uh, some perturbation uh, things will flow so the distribution will flow but the total area if i take this function and integrate it over will still remain the same if i have the same number of particles then the you know in integrated f should still be the same so when I apply electric field or magnetic field, what it typically will do is it will trace out a certain path in phase space. It will track a certain path like that. And you know, the centroid of that blob will kind of start moving. In, in classical mechanics, it's just one point. You know, if it was here, you know, if you're throwing a ball off a cliff, uh, you can find its x and, and its velocity, and you can precisely determine this thing. You know, in, 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 in classical mechanics. In quantum mechanics also, we know F is H bar dK dt and all that sort of thing. But here's the Boltzmann transport equation. In a couple of minutes, we can write the equation down. And then um, you know, solving it is, 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 is obviously, it requires a little more work. Yeah. yeah. Just to understand this, this is essentially the path through K space as a single electron with some initial K value moves from the source to the drain. Uh, it could be source to drain, yes, absolutely, or it could be any situation. It could be in a PN junction, any device. This is, um, we're doing it most generally at this point. But di electrons that started with different K values yeah. would trace different paths? Oh, absolutely, exactly. So, so different K values can track different paths. Right? But we are looking at what we are tracking one of them. And then, you know, also just to be clear, in a semiconductor, this is really the wave packet. You know the effective mass. It's not a single electron at this point, yeah, because we have all that uh, effect here. But uh, okay, so here's the Bolts, you know here's Boltzmann's thought, and I think you will all see that it's very logical. He's saying that if I have not, uh, if you know the the the, the way uh, the uh, probability that this state is occupied right now in time must be equal to the probability some time ago. With, if the particle was moving with a velocity v, then the x must have been x minus velocity times some time, right, dt. Does that make sense? And then at that point, there was some probability. Similarly, the k could have changed, right? k minus, how does k change in quantum mechanics, right? So, due to force, right? What is the equation? Force is h bar dk dt, right? So, if I have a force, divided by Planck's constant times dt. Right? To some total of all forces, electric, magnetic, whatever be it. Right? So, so, so. And then t minus dt. Right. So what he's saying is if, if I'm, uh, the probability of this point being in phase space being occupied is equal to the probability it was dt ago in time. But then, you know, the, if, uh, this is true only if this thing is moving in x or in moving in k, right? So, so that's how you fill it. Right? If you have no force, then you can't change k, so it, it has to be like, you know, horizontal. If you don't have any change in x, if your particle is sitting at one point, then you can't change x, you stand this way, right? But uh, if you have changing both, so it's moving with velocity and there's a force. And actually, that's not all. There may be that I scatter into this state from somewhere outside that path. Some other path goes, comes in here, or I scatter out of this. I have two other possibilities, right? So I can come in, or I can go out. These are scattering rates in per second. I can scatter particles, fill the state with particles coming from here, or empty this into other states here. So I must also include that possibility that I can increase if I scatter in, or decrease if I scatter out. So, so that's, that's your, logically it should be very clear that this is, uh, this is obviously all, all that can happen potentially, right? Uh, and, uh, and this scattering part could be due to light. I mean, it could be recombining and into this, this recombination and all that. It could be because of other things too, it's just not just uh, you know, scattering like that. And then uh, you know, what he says is uh, uh, I can take this and look at smaller and smaller times and and uh, uh, you know you can do the Taylor series on this now, right? Your Taylor series on this for small times, and uh, you can see that it will be equal to f of x k t, and and then there'll be three terms. The first term will be 
minus v dt, then partial derivative with respect to distance, right? the function changing in distance, this way, minus force over h bar dt times the partial derivative with k, or the wave vector, 2 pi by the wavelength, right? minus That's what you get uh, when you do the first, retain the first term of the Taylor series, and it's in minus s out. Uh, I, I think I should have been corrected. So here, this is the scattering rate. So the net scattering in or out time should multiply by time. So you get a dt. Uh, I think a little bit over time, but uh, we are almost done with uh, deriving this equation. So uh, I think we leave it here and then take it. Away. So essentially, now you can see that that goes away. And you can divide by dt everywhere. That goes away. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that one goes away. And your this, this is the Boltzmann transport equation: velocity times rate of change of distribution function plus force over Planck's constant. Rate of change of distribution function is equal to net scattering in minus net scattering out. So that's that's your full. Boltzmann transport equation, and I, I'll just want add one more layer to it. The scattering in, if I have electrons that are scattering from states here, let's call it k prime state. Here, this is state k. If I'm scattering from here to here, then this state must be occupied, and that state must be empty, right? Uh, and and, and uh, there's, there's certain probabilities if there are electrons, yeah. Should there be a Oh, you're right, you're right, sorry, yeah. Oh. You're right, yeah. So that, that's the total Boltzmann. Absolutely, thanks. Uh, so the net scattering rate in, uh, uh, maybe uh, if I'm scattering from, S of, you know, from state k prime to k, then uh, I'm writing s in now. Then state k prime must be occupied, and state k must be empty. And that's, that's my Fermi function based probabilities, right? Minus the reverse process, k prime to k times f of k and 1 minus f of k prime. So that's s, s out. So what I wrote here, so this is the full-blown version. Uh, and, and, and this is for any state k prime which lies outside. Uh, yeah, 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 k to k prime, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, this is for all states k prime that are outside that state, so we have to sum it over k. So this is kind of the full-blown version of Boltzmann transport equation. And you can see it's a conceptual equation. It's not giving you any solutions yet. And, and uh, I think what, uh, uh, but, but you know, a lot of the physics of scattering is now captured inside there. And all the physics, details, detailed physics is sitting inside these two terms, the scattering rates physically. You know from other states to this state, or this state to that state. And, and, and uh, uh, the, um, so I will not, uh, so essentially I'll leave it at this point today. And uh, in the next class, uh, we will apply it. So I, I know you have, you have a, uh, assignments uh, problem to solve on this, so I think we'll, we'll have to give you some more time for, for doing that. Um, uh, let me just uh, make sure. All right, so physically, just to summarize, you know, we, uh, this is the picture. We have uh, occupation function uh, at some point, and you are scattering in and out. Here are the probabilities. Here's the full-blown Boltzmann transport equation. We did it for one dimension, but it, it can go to higher dimensions, 3D, whatever, right? Uh, instead of velocity being a scalar, it becomes a great, you know, vector. And d by dx becomes a gradient uh, with space. Similarly, d by dk becomes a gradient in k space, right? And this is the force, and these are the scattering rates. Now, scattering rates is what you get from this Fermi Golden Rule. That's you know a separate thing which we're going to talk about. But uh, that's how you evaluate it. You find the matrix element for transition from k prime to k, and then you sum the whole thing, and you get your f of k's. That being said, it looks complicated, but under certain approximations, this is the solution. We wrote down the solution. This is going to be the solution. It's called the re relaxation time approximation. And with this, we can explain mobility, velocity, saturation velocity, when you have a lot of scattering and all that. So uh, I, uh, I think because you have one problem, the last problem of the current assignment, which is on this 
uh, on this aspect. You can start working on it, uh, but uh, I, I'll give you a little more time to finish this up. Okay, so yeah. The la yeah, last problem of the current assignment has some aspect of this this uh, scattering rates involved in it. Yeah, so, yeah. Do we, do we get more time for the total uh, uh, yeah. So let's 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 do that. Let's do a turn in the assignment next week. You know, after Tuesday, I'll send out mm. Wednesday probably. Thank you.